What makes the best leaders? How do you get genuine buy-in from your team? What's the best way to stand up for what you believe in, even when it's hard? On today's show, we'll hear insights, ideas, and actionable advice from Harry Kramer, former CEO of Baxter Healthcare, and now a professor at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. We recently sat down and discussed leading with values, the power of communication, and a lot more. Welcome to Stand Up to Stand Out, the podcast. I'm your host, Stuart Papp, and for the last decade plus, I've been working with innovators and leaders inspire others to take action. My goal with this podcast is to give you practical, tactical advice that you can use now. Whether you're scaling a company, leading a new team, or advocating for meaningful change, this show is designed to help you make a positive impact with those who count. So let's learn together and have some fun along the way. Let's get to it. He's the former chairman and chief executive officer of Baxter International, the multi-billion dollar global healthcare company where he worked for more than 20 years. The last six, he was chairman and CEO. He's also the author of multiple books. One I want to really dive into, From Values to Action, The Four Principles of Value-Based Leadership. It's great to be with you. So my first question is, I know you were a math and I believe econ major at Lawrence, and I want to know when you fell in love with math. Stuart, probably in the first or second grade. I just love numbers. Uh, numbers were something that I enjoyed. And I think as I got a little older, uh, we all go through different transitions. But I think when I was in high school, I really fell in love with it because, you know, I could take a math test and I knew if I was right. And there wasn't a question if I was right. Uh, and then I would take a, I'd write a 20 page history paper, best paper I ever wrote in my life, and I get a C minus. And so, you know, boy, oh boy, I, I, I like the concreteness of, uh, of math. Uh, I love the beauty of it. I love solving problems. And uh, I, I actually thought I was going to get a PhD in math. And uh, the reason I didn't was a, it's its own little story. But I, I, I love math. So let's talk about the juxtaposition of math and concrete numbers with a lot of the fuzzier questions that might occur in strategy and leadership. Yeah, Stuart, it is a big, big issue, okay, or a big, big challenge and, and a big, big opportunity. So And the way I talk about this with the Kellogg students is everything is a balance, right? So in my mind, yes, it's important to know, you know, what I think we sometimes call the hard skills, the mathematics, the finance, the accounting, what's the cost of capital. Uh, And in your first couple of jobs, as you articulated, that's a big piece of this. You know, you've got a a very clear role to play. You've got a clear functional role to play and that analytical ability to solve a problem. What people often don't realize is very rapidly for sure after five, six, seven years, okay? Yes, it's nice to have those analytical skills, but it's all those, I don't like the word, but it's all those soft skills, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, Can you lead people? Can you manage people? Can you prioritize? Can you motivate people? Um, And at the end of the day, this idea of, oh, I need to know all of this be replaced with, no, do I have the ability to attract the people that are gonna make it happen? Or another way to say it, Stuart, early in your career, the person who's very bright and very analytical wow, they can move up and they can do the work of two or three people. They're remarkable. And I used to say at Baxter when I first got there, boy, some of these people can do the work of three people. I can barely do the work of one person. However, (laughs) however, I'm not sure many of these people can do the work of 30 or 40 people. So the faster you realize that it really is all about the softer skills and the higher up you go, the more important that the more important they become. Absolutely. Yeah, I, so I agree. I don't like the word soft skills, but there's a, a statement I, I stick with, which is hard skills get you in the door, but soft skills get you promoted. Um, but at the end of the day, whether it's a biotech or a tech company or whatever it is, I, I believe that it's a people business because it's people working with other people to impact people. Even if you're working with cloud computing, AI, it doesn't matter. It's still going to affect you know humans. So I, I completely agree. Um, I want to read a passage from your book, your first book, which is just a quick snippet here. You say, leadership is not about the leader. Leadership is about the growth or leadership is about the growth and positive change that a leader can bring about while working with others. And my question to you is, can anyone be a leader at a company? Leadership has everything to do with the ability to influence people 
And the only way I know how to influence people is you have to be able to relate to people. So my entire model, Stuart, is three words, leadership, influence, relate. Okay. Practical way. If I can relate to you, really understand you, what motivates you, get you to realize, hey, Harry has no agenda here other than to be helpful. Well, then maybe I can influence you if I can influence you and I can lead you. So it almost sounds a little uh, overly simplified what you said, but it's all about people. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all about people. So uh, leadership feels heavy at times. People feel like that someone has to choose them to be a leader or I wasn't anointed leader or how, who am I to lead? But then again, people are always leading, even self-driven solopreneurs, people who work in small entities, small uh, startups. So whether it's a, a, a large company or a small, does it seem like leadership is a series of actions or is it something bigger than that? You know, I, I love your question, Stuart. The way, the way I kind of think about this is I can be anywhere and, and, I, and I'll role play. Uh, I start out at Baxter. I'm a junior analyst. Uh, it's, my, it's my first week. All right. Well, if, if I literally have some views on something, I've got some ideas on something and you may be my boss or Stuart, you may be my boss's boss. But if you want to do something and make a decision and I literally think, you know what, respectfully, I'll always be respectful. There's a better decision to be made. I'm going to figure out a way to relate to you. And literally, I'll be very respectful, but hey, Stuart, you're the boss. You may want to go there, but I'm just kind of thinking, are you aware of this, Stuart? Are you aware of that? And given that, would, would this make any sense? And by the way, Stuart, I'm here to be helpful. And I'm going to convince you beyond words, I have absolutely no agenda here other than to be helpful. And you start to say, you know what? I'm going to listen to Harry. That sort of makes sense. He can influence me. And in my mind, that's what leadership is all about. Some of the best leaders I've ever seen have absolutely nobody reporting to them. In fact, as a test for leaders, Stuart, and I look at my own career, it's a little ironic. You know, I ended up becoming the CEO uh, with 55,000 people because jobs I really liked the most was if I could, you're in another department, you're in another, you may be a peer of mine, you certainly don't report to me, but my ability to convince you that this makes sense and we ought to do that always felt better to me than, well, you're going to do it because you happen to report to me. And I think that the faster people realize Every person can develop leadership skills without having to look at any kind of organizational chart. Right. Well, something in this role play that I was paying attention to is how much signaling you were doing, letting people know that I'm here to help. You said that a few times. What if open questions to really allow the other person to sort of select themselves in to getting clear feedback instead of me saying in this bad role play, Harry, I've done the work. Now you listen to me at that point, you know, you're going to you know, shut me out forever or even worse, kick me out, which is the right thing. So how did you learn to signal that way? You know, whether it's coming up or high school, college beyond, or even just at, at, at Baxter, how do you learn to signal that? Because not everyone has that ability, Harry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Stuart, just a great, great, great focus to think about. Number one, I decided early on, and it sounds sort of crazy to say this, but I, I've had no agenda other than to be helpful and try to do the right thing. That's sort of almost mm -hmm. a values kind of thing for me. And mm -hmm. so I, I kind of looked at it as, boy, the more I can understand people, the more I can relate to people, the more I realize no matter who I talk to, I can learn something from. So if I just meet you for the first time, I'm just really curious as we started off before we got on, you know, hey, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? How do you look at things? What's important to you? Um, and as I start to understand you, you can be very different. In high school, I love the idea that I would get together with some really strong, brilliant mathematical guys, but I was on the baseball team with guys I'd be helping with their algebra homework. And mm -hmm. I tried to relate to as many people as I could because I just found it very interesting. How do you relate to people of different age, different gender, different race, uh, different countries? Um, and I realized, wow, if you can cut through and really take the time to listen, it's, it's not about me. Really understand that the impact you can have on other people is huge. And it, they are people at all different areas, all different responsibilities. And once people feel like they can relate to you, your ability to impact people is, is unbelievably huge. It's amazing. Yeah. I get so excited about Stuart. It's amazing to me. If, if you can take the time to relate to people that may be very, very different than you. Yeah. 
Incredible. I love that. And, you know, I mean, look, I will, I'll say this right up front. It's clear to me why you've had so much success because you have that balance of, of warmth and, and credibility. You know the numbers. It's clear you have all that, but you're also a warm, affable, and energetic. You care about what, what we're doing. And so it, it's very clear to me uh, how you've gotten where you've gotten, but you also are very humble about that. And you mention a lot of luck and timing. And I do want to toggle between those two, but actually I want to be a bit selfish here and talk about the four values. So the four values that you talk about in your excellent book, and I recommend everyone pick it up. I just loved reading it, chock full of stories, practical advice. Um, and they are in order, self-reflection, balance and perspective, true self-confidence, double underline, that's a Harryism, and then genuine humility. Now I'm going to pitch it back to you and you're going to tell me what I got wrong. Here's how I interpret those four values in order. Know yourself, seek to understand, do the work, stay grounded. All right. How did I do? I think I have to give you an A and I'm a pretty tough grader at Kellogg, Stewart. But I actually will have to write that down because it takes me about an hour to go through those. And I thought that was perfect. That was absolutely perfect. I mean, that sincerely. It was perfect. Okay. All right. Well, that, you know, uh, I really learned so much. And actually, I want you to share a story uh, about Disney World with your kids. Now, at this point, just to set the scene, your children were young. Your wife, uh, you and your wife, uh, Julie, took your kids to Florida. And while you were on your way back to the parking lot, one of your young children saw a Baxter truck in the parking lot at the hotel. And I want to let you take it from there because I love this story. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we were uh, in the, at the hotel and uh, my young fellow, he didn't uh, couldn't read very well, but he knew the word Baxter because he knew dad worked at Baxter. So he starts yelling out, dad's truck, dad's truck. And I thought, okay, here we go. So we walked over to the truck and there was a fellow that was unloading a, a lot of boxes. And because uh, it was a patient that needed some medical supplies. And so uh, I, I said, oh, uh, uh, come on, Andrew, we'll, 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 uh, we'll help this guy out. So, you know, we start unloading the boxes. The guy was really warm, whatever. So we unload all the boxes and uh, the guy gets back, you know, in, in the truck. And uh, uh, I, I said, what's your name? And he told me his name. I can't remember what it was, Jack. And he goes, well, what's your name? Harry. Uh, what do you do? I said, oh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I work at Baxter. And he goes, oh, that's great. That, 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 that's super. Um, so he left and, and you know, that was it. So I teased that the next morning, you know, one of the rules is, you know, we're not supposed to do a lot of email. We're on vacation. So what does that mean with all the kids? I'm locked in the bathroom with the light out, you know, at six in the morning, sitting in the bathtub doing emails. And I'm going through like an amazing number of emails. And these emails uh, basically are from a truck driver in Kansas City saying, um, hey, uh, when are you coming to Kansas City to unload my truck? And I thought, wait a second, I got all these emails. How, what is this? So I called up Kathy, uh, who was a wonderful, wonderful person, was my assistant for many, many years. And she was another great leader. She led me, by the way. Uh, and I said, I said, Kathy, you're not going to believe what's happening. And she said, and I said, I, I, I didn't tell this guy anything. He would have no idea. And he goes, well, Harry, there's not a lot of Harry's. And so he said, this guy must have looked up and realized you were the CEO of the company. Um, and he started to spread around to it to, to the other folks. And, you know, I kind of look at it as, hey, we're all in this together. You know, you talk about genuine humility. Every single person matters to it. In fact, uh, you're catching me at a good time because I had my class last night. And what I always do with one of the classes, Stuart, I'll, you know, like we'll have 70, 80 people and I'll say, well, how many of you want to be a leader? Everybody raises their hand. How many of you people actually think you relate well to people? Everybody raise their hand. So now don't raise your hand this time. How many folks, when you go into the building, know the name of the first person at the desk? How many people, when you go into the cafeteria, know what their favorite sport team is? And if you happen to be there late at night, how many of you, when they're coming by with the cleaning crew, do you take a couple minutes and just empty out a couple trash baskets? Um, and I, I, by the way, I told the students last night, I don't do that to necessarily be helpful. When I do that, to your point on genuine humility, it reminds me when I do that, that if it wasn't for luck, timing, the team, mentors, and for some of us, a spiritual perspective, I could easily be part of the cleaning crew. Never forget where you came from. I think I refer to it as remember the cube, because most of us, as you know, Stuart, start either a cubicle, a bullpen, or maybe a car if you were a sales rep. And I think that staying grounded is not only the right values thing to do, 
as you know, Stuart, it helps you relate to people. And as a team, they'll do anything for you. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. It's it's all true. Um, and I, I want to talk about someone who joins a company. You know, a lot of the people I have the privilege of working with are in these very fast moving, fast growing companies, um, incredibly bright, very driven, and and coming from a, let's call it individual contributor, where they're hired for their, you know, intellectual prowess or their computing abilities, and all of that is great. And then what happens is someone will say, you're going to stand up a team, or you're, you're going to lead this project, and that turns one into the other. And sometimes they'll say, you know, where do I begin? So in this scenario, if you imagine someone who's been valued for their degrees and their abilities to get things done, which is amazing, and that is leadership, we know. But now who's going to be doing that with a group that's going to report to them, a team? How would you get started in that situation? Or what are some ideas that can get them started and on the fast track to connecting with that team? And, and when they come in, Stuart, we'll play this out. They come in now, they've got a team that's reporting to them now? Yeah. Or, or, are, they, so, or are they at the low level where they come in and they don't have anybody? There are two different cases here. Yeah. So thank you for that. I'd say that transitioning where they're getting the nod that they're now going to be leading a team and people are going to report to them. So this yeah. is you know, at that inflection point. And they're saying, and I, I have a client going through this right now, where, where do I begin? Sure. All right, so let's let's role play this one, uh, Stuart. So I can, and then just keep jumping, and interrupt me, make sure that I'm, I'm focused on what you're here. So I look at it, Stuart, is I come in and uh, I've got a group of now 10 people reporting to me. I'm brand new, yep. I'm, I'm just right there. The way I think about this and what I would strongly advise very early on, within the first couple of days, is I would sit down with my team, let, let's call it 10 folks, and I have this little process that I just call setting clear expectations. And the reason I say that, Stuart, a lot of times you get in a job and you make an assumption. Oh, well, these people now work for me. Um, they're going to do what I ask them to do. And uh, they're going to expect me to make the decision. And maybe I'm not supposed to challenge Harry. How's this all going to work? I lay out and set a clear expectation. And that clear expectation isn't a dictatorship. It's, hey, I think this may make sense, but, but what do you folks think? And the way I would literally do it, Stuart, is I get excited about this. I would literally say, okay, you know what? First of all, you're one of them, Stuart. Hey, welcome to you and the other nine people. I'm honored to be in this role, okay? And here's the way I like to operate. Um, I intend to rely on all of you. And by the way, okay, if I'm the leader, I'll make, I may make the final decision on some things, but I'm not going to make a decision, Stuart, without your input. And if you particularly have some views on this. So always let me know what you think. And by the way, you're going to have to get used to this. But one of the things I want to do is I may have a view. But if your view makes more sense, Stuart, I have absolutely no problem, zero problem changing my mind, because what I'll try to convince you of very early on, Stuart, is I have absolutely no need to be right. I'm fanatically focused on trying to do the right thing, right? So, and by the way, Stuart, since you guys are on my team, you don't have to wonder, oh, that could be a sensitive topic. I don't know if we can bring that up. Here's the guiding principles in terms of setting expectations. Stuart, the only reason I know something that you don't is because you don't ask, and I didn't think of telling you because I thought you already knew, all right? We are going to be a phenomenal team. And by the way, sometimes we may make a mistake. Guess what? We are, because if we're not making mistakes and we're not failing, we're probably not growing, right? And so I would try to think through, Stuart, all the things ahead of time. I mean, I may even say, I don't know if this is going to happen, but when the 10 of us are in a room, Stuart, um, I really want to make sure that all 10 people get a chance to talk. I I'm sure this won't happen, but if one person ends up you know, deciding you're going to spend most of the time talking, you know, I may say, you know what, Stuart, maybe just calm down a little bit. Let's hear the other input. So if you think about what mostly goes wrong on a team, Stuart, you can yep. predict it ahead of time. So I try to lay out as many things as I can think about and basically say, hey, does this make sense? Do you folks want to do this differently? Creating an environment where, where we are a team and we're all working for a customer, we're all working for a patient, you're, you're not working for me. So two follow-up questions to that excellent role play, because I got that you have the right intention, right goals, right perspective. Got it. Now, how do you, in this role play, ensure that A, you hear from all voices, and B, that the sequence in which you hear from all voices is somehow reflecting the true voice of the room? Because sometimes the loudest voice will dominate, and I hear this a lot, and someone else who has a point of view, who may have 
uh, language concerns, cultural concerns, personality concerns, doesn't get a chance or feels not empowered to share. So my question back to you in this leadership scenario, Harry, is A, how do you ensure you hear all voices mm -hmm. and hear, read, let's say that solicit all, and B, in, in a sequence that will optimize the performance of your team? Because in this scenario, my mm -hmm. assumption is that you want optimal performance in whatever you're doing. Yeah. So your, your questions are really phenomenal. This one's a great one. So I'll tell you exactly what I do. So when I would come in and I have these 10 folks, the first thing I would do is I would get their CV or their bio for the 10 people. And mm -hmm. I would literally kind of rank them in terms of who appears, sounds like based on their experience, maybe a little bit more shy or a little bit more introverted or whatever, versus somebody, depending on the school they went to or whatever, you know, they've been taught to kind of like jump out and, and go for it. Yeah. I love that. And so what I love about this process, Harry, is that you're relying on multiple modalities to solicit the best feedback that will service the group. And so reading, thinking about, even looking at spatial orientation, who's sitting next to you versus away, all of these, I feel, tap into that emotional intelligence and really that leadership quotient of how do I get the best results and optimize the performance of this team with these assemblage of 10 people, 100, 1,000, and, you know, as the numbers get bigger. So excellent, exactly. very practical advice. Yeah. I want to dive back a little bit. In the opening of your first book, you talk about values and you talk about how your parents uh, taught you the values. And so I just want to talk about that word, because I think it's one of those words that we hear a lot. We say absolutely. And then when I go, how do I explain them? <laughs> I pulled out my trusty synonym finder here. And I was like, looking up values and, you know, principles and standards. And so I thought I'd just ask you, you know, what does that mean to you? What do values mean to you? Yeah. Um, I got a taste. Of it. I, I love this conversation. I, I truly love it. So what, the way I describe this in, in class, and then I'll give you some specific examples, is, first of all, you're absolutely right. Many, many people either don't know what it means or they get very confused. And sometimes I think it's helpful to describe what something is not, that it helps you. There is a big difference, I think, between values and preferences. Let's go back to that example of the, of the 10 people. One of the expectations I may set up front is, you know what, we're going to be respectful of one another. But we're not going to use four-letter words. Now, if you do, I'm going to let you know I don't like it, okay, and I don't prefer it, but, but I'm not going to fire you, okay? It's a preference. But a value, the way I think about values is, is really two things. Number one, you'll never compromise them. And number two, they're not negotiable, right? Because if you're willing to compromise or they're negotiable, I'm not sure what it is, but, but I don't think it's a value. So I actually step back. And in my first class, I asked students to literally think about, you know, what really matters in your life? What really drives you? What, what do you think the, the short time you're on this earth really means? How do we want to treat people? How, how do you think about success versus significance? How do you think about what really matters? And let's make sure that as a group, if something really does matter, and this is the way we're going to operate, there are, there are no exceptions to it. And one of the things that I think is very helpful, I mean, we won't get into specifics unless you'd like, my friend, but when you look at every day, some of the craziness uh, and the, the lack of values that go on in organizations, I think it's because people didn't set an expectation. They didn't set an expectation. And, and if you let people know up front, you know, this is acceptable and this isn't, and remind people, because based on the way people grew up, you know, the way you, you and I grew up with our families and our grandparents is, could be very different than other people. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, one of the divisions that I had the opportunity to run, um, I found out I was going to move into this job. And the first week I was there, they said, oh, we didn't tell you because you're new to the division, but the sales meeting uh, is next week. And, you know, you should probably go because you're the, you're the new the new president of the division. And I said, oh, OK, fine. Well, where is it? And he said, well, well, it's in Las Vegas. OK, well, I thought to myself, I can either make the assumption that this is all going to go really well. You know, you know where I'm heading on this one or I'm not going to make an assumption. So I got a conference call with 300 people and I said, hey, look, I'm looking forward to meeting everybody. Now, I'm sure this won't happen. I'm sure this won't happen. But if any of the following things occur in Las Vegas in terms of over drinking or sexual harassment or whatever, if they happen, okay, you will not be here. 
but I'm sure that won't happen. Okay. Because one of the things I look at is I feel really strongly in leadership influence relief. I don't want to surprise people. And if I have to have a discussion with you, Stuart, that says, you know what, my friend, you're leaving. Your reaction isn't going to be, oh, I'm surprised. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because when I think about feedback, I think about development. If you're really good at this, the one thing you will not do is surprise people. And I think making very clear what it is, why it is, how we're going to operate and constantly reinforce it, I think makes all the difference in the world. But it starts with you, right? Because until it's very clear in your mind what your values are, very difficult to impose them on other people. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a couple more topics I want to explore, but to go with this, you're setting that from the top down and you're saying, this is my expectation of you. Now, sometimes when people are joining companies, they're happy to be there, they're getting up, up to speed, they're meeting the team. And what I often hear is, I want to have a wonderful, you know, safe, happy, innovative environment here but I'm unsure about how to go about building that. I'm unsure about what my company stands for. I've been to the town halls. I read the speaking points. I get every email. How does somebody start to understand and deepen the values if they feel like they're a, 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 you know, an individual contributor and they're just getting to know this organization? How do they really get to the bottom of those values and really see them, not just on the page, because there's very well, uh, good writers, but in action, in, yeah. in practice. Yeah, Stuart, super one. So let me, let me give it to you in a couple different segments here, okay? Number one, again, I role play. Number one, before I come to your company, okay, I'm gonna check this out. And it isn't what I see written someplace. I may talk to some people that are in the company, but the problem with that is, even if there's problems, if there really are problems, they're gonna tell me, or I'm gonna wonder, why are you there? The best of all worlds that I always explain to students, Stuart, and this is a home run, is I find people that work for Stuart's company that are no longer there. And is that, is that because the values weren't consistent or it was it was so fantastic? If I hadn't spent five years with Stuart, there's no way I would have moved on to be a vice president. OK, you can learn a tremendous amount objectively from talking to the people. OK, so I do my homework. I now get in the company. Now, one of two things happen. Either. It is consistent with my values and life mm -hmm. is good. Okay. But let's get serious now. I'm there and it's not that good. There are problems. All right. Well, two things. First, rather than, oh, well, those people up there aren't living the values. Wait a minute. I've got in your example from before, I've got 10 people. I'm going to start with the 10 people I have. Okay. Yes, that may not be going on there, but it's going to go on with me and I'm going to be able to try to start that. However, however, what if the folks up there are making it to the point where I can't live the values I want and the organization isn't doing it above me, all right? One option is I leave right away. Well, I don't leave right away, my mind, because if I'm a value-based leader, maybe it's because Stuart just, just doesn't get it. Maybe Stuart didn't grow up that way. Maybe Stuart was in an environment where you get 10 people in a room and you make fun of one of the people and yell and scream it rather than taking that one person. So one, I check it out before I get there. Two, I do what I can do. Three, I try to change the behavior. And if I can't, then I'll go someplace else. Because if I stick around, how could it be values? How could it be values? That is excellent. Extremely practical. Um, I want to pivot to communication and ask you, you know, chairman, CEO, you've played many roles. What is the value of clear, compelling, and concise communication in any organization, be it big or small? I. I think the two most important words in my life as a leader are people and communication. And the people word stands for, my friend, attracting, recruiting, hiring, developing, open, feedback, the whole people thing. The second half is communication. Making sure, Stuart, every single person in the organization knows what we're doing, why we're doing it, how they fit in, and very important, you don't just tolerate them challenging, you require them to challenge because I said before, you've convinced them you have no need to be right, you're trying to do the right thing. And by the way, my friend, if you're in a managerial or leadership role for any of your, your, uh, your, your listeners, I would say the combination of people and communication is probably 90% of your job. And by the way, I get challenged a lot. So one CEO said to me, wait a minute, wait a minute, you said we could challenge. If you're spending 90% of your time on people and communication, well, when, when do you get a lot of work done, right? I always have to smile, right? If, the famous if. 
if I've got all the right people, not six out of 10, if I got 10 out of 10, because that's the environment I've created. And if everybody knows exactly what we need to do and why as a team, what else is there to do? So I am a fanatic steward of this effective communication. And I worry sometimes the world we're living in now, oh, you know, I'll flip you a little uh, text or that. No, do you have open communication where you and I can challenge one another, talk to one another? Um, it's, it's everything. The communication piece is it. And I can see a lot of bright people. You talked earlier today. You have some brilliant, brilliant people who literally have difficult communicating and they're going to have a very difficult time leading people. One of my favorite passages of your book that just leapt into my brain and it's going to live there, hopefully for the rest of my life, is the following. As a leader striving to influence others positively, you must rely on your true self-confidence along with self-reflection and balance to guide you. If you do, you will be able to reflect on an issue and ask yourself, if this were my company, what would I do? And here's the killer line, Harry. By the way, it is your company. I just, I saw that and I thought, this is magic. Can you unpack that for me and help me translate that for anyone who's joining a company, starting a company, starting a team, you name it, wherever they are in their trajectory. What does that mean to you? And where did that come from? Um, no, I'm smiling, Stu, because I, I do think about that every day. And I talk to students about it. You, you may join a company that has two people or 25,000 people. But if I join that company, okay, that's, that's my company now. Uh, and I care about the company. I care about making an impact. And I look at myself in that organization, wherever I happen to be, it's all about, can I have be able to relate, influence, and lead? And there's three dimensions, right? I mean, the people who report to me, I will be leading them. The people that are my peers, do you and I are at the same level? Well, I'll figure out a way to interact with you to maybe help you in any way I can. And you can help me in any way you can. And then the people above us, where the leading up comes in, is that if you're up there, and even if you're the CEO of the company, um, I feel the obligation not to make you happy, but to help you make the right decisions. And I will be unbelievably respectful, as, as I mentioned before. And the sense of, it, it is my company. Um, I, I felt that way even when I was 16. I, I worked at a toy store. Uh, filling the shelves, I would go around and say, hey, th this is my this is my uh, my store. I'm going to make sure these shelves are in perfect condition. And anybody who comes in there is, is a customer of ours. Um, I mean, I, I think I was making back then, back in the dark, I think I was making $1.65 an hour. Okay, that's what I was making in Scranton, Pennsylvania, right? Uh, but boy, oh boy, it was, I, I took it very seriously. I, I, I view it the, and I view every job that way. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, one of the things you talk about in the value of communication is helping people understand why they're doing something. And I see this all the time where people say, look, I will jump over uh, you know, a, a fence here, but I need to know why or why we're not doing that. So how does one start to embrace the explaining why in a way that is satisfying to give people context about the value of their work? Yeah. Um, because I do think once you're connected to the reason why you're doing it, you, you start to feel empowered and inspired to, to go further. So yeah. help me understand how you encourage people to communicate the why behind decisions. Yeah. So this, this is actually really key, Stuart. And in fact, uh, you know, your, your listeners can maybe do this while we're, while we're having this discussion. I literally tell people, Stuart, to take a piece of paper and literally draw, literally draw a series of vertical parallel lines on a piece of paper, okay? And I look at it and say, that, 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 those vertical parallel lines, okay, that's really any organization. Because any organization, you are on in a function, you're in a division, or you're in a geography. And I think what happens is that everybody is in that little silo, okay? And therefore, well, why is that? Why is that? And there's three things that I encourage people to do, Stuart. This turns out to be my favorite chart that has an enormous impact on what you're saying. When I was in finance as a junior guy in that, on that vertical parallel line finance, I could have just said, okay, my role is I'm a finance guy working for the company, and I want to be a good finance guy working for the company. But then it occurred to me, wait a minute, no, I don't want to be a good finance guy working for the company. I want to be a business leader in the organization who, among other things, knows a lot about finance. Those are two very different people. 
right? So what I decided to do was three things that I encourage people to think about, Stuart. Early on, I decided I would get to know one or two people in every one of those vertical parallel lines. Okay, Stuart, you're in marketing. This guy's in operations. And I would get to know a few of those people. So instead of me thinking this way now, I'm broadening the way I'm looking at things, number one. Number two, in any organization, as you know, Stuart, the very senior people, the CEO and the CFO, they usually have to talk to this group of people called shareholders, okay? And nowadays, you can get on the web, you can listen to the hour call. Well, back in the dark ages, Stuart, I used to get those little cassette tapes. I would sit in my cubicle. I would listen to the question the guy from Goldman Sachs would be asking the CEO. I'd shut the recorder off and say, if I was the CEO or the CFO, how would I answer that question? Never thinking I'd be in those jobs. And then I'd listen to the answer. If the answer had to do with a joint venture in Germany, I could call somebody in Munich and say, hey, I heard the CEO talking about this. What, what does that mean? Right. And then the third piece, I thought, I'm in finance, I'm in that role, but I don't have to have lunch with finance people every day. I go into the cafeteria, and I think I use this example in one of the books where I'd sit down with three people. Well, you guys are engineers. What do you do? Well, we're going to build an intravenous fluid drug delivery plant in Shanghai. Well, I was a math major. If you need any help, I could actually do a little modeling. Three weeks later, I get a call from my boss, Stuart. They send me to Singapore for three weeks. I'm learning manufacturing, doing this in Asia. And what happens, Stuart, is rather than being on one of these vertical parallel lines, you become one of the very, very few people who draws a circle around the whole piece. And now you understand exactly why. All right, I'm in finance. We've got to save money. Why is, why is Stuart spending more money in, in marketing? Oh, we're launching a new product. We're now going to get into Europe. And so you now start to look at, it is my company. It's not my functional area. It's my company. And when somebody says, by the way, when you get this a lot, Stuart, well, why, why, are, why are we doing that? Or somebody will say, well, I don't understand why. I always tease people. When somebody says, I don't understand, Stuart, think about it. Usually, they don't want to understand. They're letting you know they disagree with you. So when anybody says to me, this happened to board me the other day. Well, Harry, I don't understand. I say, Stuart, Stuart, would you like to understand? Because if you like to understand, I'm happy to explain it to you. And then you can decide whether you agree or disagree. So, right. so in my mind, the best way to get people to think about the why is being able to put the, in the context of what are we trying to do over? How does this all fit together? Yeah. Well, you, there's incredibly valuable advice there. But a couple of things I got from that was first, inverting your title. So not saying I'm an expert in this who happens to work here. You say, I'm business minded who happens to have this expertise. So that's the first inversion. Second is looking at the vertical line and thinking what's happening horizontally. And third, approaching them with a very open mindset. What are you working on? Can I be of service instead of why are you doing that and challenging? So all of these are incredibly valuable that I think that transformation, Harry, I'm not sure where you learned that or if this is instinctive or you had good uh, mentors or probably a combination of things, but to really sort of fire your own expert, keep, keep that person as part of who you are, but really adopting that more both vertical and, and horizontal mindset with an open mandate to learn and be of service is what I'm gleaning from that. Well said. Well said. Absolutely. Being able, being able to put things into context. And here's another expression, uh, Stuart. You've probably heard somebody will say, "Well, what, what kind of guy is uh, what kind of guy is Mary?" And they'll say, "Well, really, really great. The problem with Mary is she gets a little bit lost in the trees. She doesn't see the forest." You know that expression? Right. Say, I've worked with some people, Stuart, who don't even get to the trees. Okay, they're they're in the uh, they're in the root system. And one of the things I ask everybody to think about is. How do you get from the, the roots to the trees to the forest? How do you put this whole thing into context, okay? And your ability to do that and put it together, in my mind, helps with the why. It helps you get ownership and you feel part of it because you understand why is the company doing this? Why are we not doing that? And the ability from your communication question before is that we're open to anything. That's why I said, hey, sorry, the only reason you don't know something in this company is that you didn't ask and I didn't think of telling you because I thought you already knew. Right. Yeah. A lot of times uh, the clients I work with will say, you know, our group would like to have a bigger seat at the table of leadership because we believe that this function, you know, should be more part of strategic planning and, and all of that. And what I'm gleaning here is, you know, that's great. And everyone has something to contribute. But first, seek to understand 
what's happening and why, and really bringing that open mindset. And then from that vantage point, you can start to craft a value proposition to be of service to that group. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'll give you, Stuart, I'll give you a real good example of exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I had a group of very senior financial people in New York a couple of weeks ago. They were all senior financial people. And they said, well, I don't think we have uh, as much of a seat at the table, an influence that we'd like to have. And I said, all right, well, the question is, you can use any function in this question. Do you want to be a really good finance person working for the company? Or do you want to be a leader who, among other things, knows a lot about finance? And one of the guys said, can you give me an example? So here's a, tell me if this makes any sense. Here's a crazy example I gave. All right, we're going to pretend we're going to break for lunch. We break for lunch, then we can go into one or two rooms. You can either go into door A, where we're going to discuss what will lease accounting look like in the year 2030. Very exciting group. If you go into door B, the entire lunch store is going to be, how do we triple the market capitalization of the company? How do we take the market capitalization of this company from a billion to three billion? Now, first group in the first room, super good accountants, great for good, good people. And the second group, if you're going to, as you well know, if you're going to triple the market capitalization of this company, you better know a little bit about sales, marketing, manufacturing, R&D, supply chain, international, and 10 other things I didn't mention. And you happen to be a finance, someone with finance knowledge. Okay. And I can look at the people in the room. It's sort of like, well, no, that's, that's what, that's what those guys do. But of course, one of the lines I love to use is we are those guys. Okay. The sooner you realize you are one of those guys, men or women, by the way, uh, make, makes an enormous thing as opposed to, oh, I'm down here someplace. What are you talking about? You enter the company, you own the company, and it's your company. You be respectful, but get rolling. Yeah, I love it. It's just, it's a, not to oversimplify it, Harry, but it, it's a mindset shift. It's really putting yourself, hey, you chose me to be on this team, join this company, and now I'm here and I'm going to shake off the, the titles or whatever it is, that's all sort of helpful in some small ways, but really we're here to make a difference and make an impact. And, you know, I, I only have a few minutes left here and, and, and there's so many ways I could have gone here. I feel like I just scratched the surface and could honestly talk to you for a few more hours, but well, well, what I'd I, like I, to do- I, I, I sincerely enjoy it. So the bottom line is we'll, we'll definitely do this again sometime. I, 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 would, I would be- I'd be honored. I'd be honored to have you, uh, you know, talk more because there's so many ways to go here. Um, but, you know, I guess, you know, I'm trying to think of a pithy final question that I'd written down. And for me, the goal here, the goal of all knowledge, I'll tell you uh, quickly in university, I was taking a philosophy course and I loved it. We were studying, you know, Kierkegaard and, and, you know, all the different sort of philosophers. And I just, I loved it. And I remember I went up to my professor at the time and I said, you know, this leap of faith and, and how, how do you do this in your life? And he kind of shrugged his shoulders and you know, I don't know, and you know, write a paper. And I found that so profoundly unsatisfying, Harry, that I dedicated my life to, we have to apply and, and practice something because without putting things into practice, it's all, these books are useless if I don't try to do something with them. You should have a dog-eared copy of something, apply it. Don't, it's not a pretty ornament. Um, and part of the reason I like physical books, by the way, is it, the title is sometimes a reminder of, of what I learned from it. But, uh, but here's my question to you. If you were, you know, you, you have a, a bunch, I meet incredibly optimistic, excited, hardworking, very technically proficient people who are committed to making a difference in an organization. And it could be their own startup. They could be joining a multi-billion dollar biotech. But I know, and I have the privilege of working with people who want to make a difference. If you were to leave them or say, you know, one thing that you would hope that they keep with them throughout their career as a touchstone, no pressure, what, what would you share with this group of people who are looking to change the world for the better. Yeah, wonderful, Stuart. Um, I think about this all the time, and I lead this my classes with this in the first class. I happen to believe, Stuart, the most important thing, and I share your your love of, of philosophy. I think it all starts with taking the time to be a little self reflective. Everybody who listens to this, they're busy. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I've got an hour to listen to this. But everybody is so busy, it's busy, busy. And I think when we're busy, we confuse activity and productivity. And I highly encourage, Stuart, anybody who really wants to be a leader, is you take a small amount of time, you don't have a lot, you get off by yourself, you turn off the noise, you turn off all the apparatus, you turn these things off, and you ask yeah. yourself a, a, a series of questions. You know, what are my values? What is my purpose? No kidding around. What really matters? Okay, mm -hmm. is it just success? Is it significance? All right. 
for the blink of an eye I'm on this earth, what difference do I really want to make? What kind of a leader do I want to be? What kind of example do I want to set for others? And finding the time to do that on a daily basis, at my recommendation, I take 15 minutes a day, and we can do it beginning of the day, end of the day. Why am I doing what am I doing? What am I searching for? What's the goal? What's the end result of all of this? Um, yeah. and people often say to me, well, geez, Harry, uh, why, do you, why do you start everything in terms of leadership? Uh, the questions you're asking, why, why do you always start with self-reflection? And I get that little three-part answer, Stuart. Three parts. Number one, if I'm not self-reflective, is it possible for me to know my, myself? I don't think so. Part two, if I don't know myself, is it possible for me to lead people, lead myself? I don't think so. If I can't lead myself, how could I possibly lead others? And so it all starts, and you said it earlier, it's, it's your ability to be self-aware enough. Why am I doing this? Why is this my company? Why am I in this job? Why am I in this relationship? And I think when people say, oh, I don't have the time. Harry, sounds great, but I don't have the time. I sort of question, is it we don't have the time? Or is this something we really don't want to do? Because this could get sensitive, Stuart, right? There could be a pretty big difference between what you say is important and what you're actually doing. So if I could leave people with this thought of, you know, what really matters to you and how well aware of you of yourself will have an enormous impact on your ability to lead two people, 20 people, or, you know, 55,000 people at Baxter. Wow, that was that was beautiful. Beautifully said. And, you know, to that point, that self-reflection, you know, it was a message I got from your books, you know, over and over. The 168, the values-based leadership from values to action was just taking that time because it's your fundamental one. It's that you start with it. And I don't want to, you know, people always want to skip through and get the hack. And But mm-hmm. Harry, you keep going back to that. And what I get from that, an exercise I sometimes do, and I, I did this yesterday with an entrepreneur uh, she's coming out of Harvard, she has a PhD in computer science, but I asked her, I said, you know, if you take away, you know, you've raised funds, you've built a team, you're making progress on the product, it's all great. But if we strip it all away, and you have to start from scratch tomorrow, you know, and you're, you're in a tent in the woods, and you're going starting over, what are you committed to? And, 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 and I asked myself that, you know, I mean, I'm lucky, I have a lovely family, and I have a, a nice home, and it's great to have all these creature comforts. But if I was in the tent in the woods, or just out in the, you know, where, what would I be committed to? What's the thing that you can't take away from me? And I think that, to me, that only comes from reflection. And I love that you get people to tune that inner compass and say, let's get what's important to you so that you can go make a difference for others. So absolutely, Stuart. I mean, it, it, you, you've you got it. You've got it. You understand it. It's just uh, it's very. And to get people to think about that in different ways, it's sort of like uh, here's another uh, thought, Stuart. Often we say, oh, this is kind of important to me. I- I'm going to do that later. I'm going to do that a year from now. I'm going to do it years from now. And the, the little bizarre question I ask folks, it sounds morbid. I don't mean it that way, is if yeah. I say to somebody, OK, if uh, if a doctor came into the room right now while I'm talking to you and said, hey, Harry, I just want to let you know, um, you know, you, you've got three days left. You've got three days left. Uh, you can go run someplace to some hospital, but you got three days left. How would you react? And I'll honestly tell you, Stuart, if that happened to me right now, I wouldn't do anything differently because I know the one thing I know in this crazy world, I, I know I only have three days left at some point. And since you don't know when it is. Why would you interact with people? Why would you live your life? Why would you do anything differently than if it was your last three days? So yeah. if, if as a result of this uh, conversation I'm having today, I said something that, well, I wish I, I maybe I heard his feelings. You'll hear from me within an hour or two because, because I may not be here tomorrow. And I'm an incredibly optimistic person, but what matters in your life? And what really do you really want to be as a leader and share with other, with other people? That's wonderful. Well, Harry, this has been just an absolutely thrilling conversation and, and, and I'm inspired, I'm energized. Where should people go to learn more about you, your work, your books, everything that you're doing? What's the best place for people to find more about you, Harry? Yeah, you know what? Probably the easiest, Stuart, is by Kellogg students uh, actually set up a website. As you know, it's just harrykramer.org and Kramer has two E's in it. And at harrykramer.org, my students put up, as you know, uh, you know, some of the videos from class. There's a lot of articles. Uh, my Love students it. actually, when they set it up, I said, oh, what do I owe you for setting this up? And they said, oh, we, you need to start doing a, a blog post. And of course, at my age, I said, what's a blog post? I said, no, no, we'll take care of it. You send us an email on a particular aspect uh, and people can follow it. And by the way, I respond, Stuart, to every email. So if somebody sends me an email on that harrykrimmer.org, 
I, I respond to everyone. So well, it's been a, it's been great. a pleasure, been a real pleasure, Stuart, and uh, we ought to do it again sometime. Yeah, I would love to, and it's just a total honor. And and to that, you know, you responded directly to this inquiry, and it was just so gracious. And I immediately I told my wife, and I, I said, you know, hey, we've got Harry, and I know it's going to be great because I know who you are and what you stood for, just having not even met you. So I thank you for your contribution and you continued. And uh, it's just been an honor to speak with you, Harry. So I wish you the best and uh, have a wonderful weekend. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Take good care, Stuart. It was wonderful. All right. Thanks again, Harry. Thanks for listening to the Stand Up to Stand Out, the podcast. If you're enjoying the show, I urge you to check out influencedna.co and find the podcast page where you can find show notes, links to the guests, extra resources, and a whole lot more. Also, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and make sure to sign up for our mailing list. If you have questions about the show or comments about how we can improve it, drop us a line. I will read every single message. That's podcast at influencedna.co. If you like what you heard, I'd say leave us a five-star review. And if you hated what you heard, leave us a six-star review. Either way, we're not stopping. See you on the next show.